Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined by another one of the original Colorado Silver Bullets, Michelle Deloso. Michelle, thanks for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. So uh, it's kind of funny, you know, you and I had just met um, through Tina Whitlock, who, who connected us after I did the uh, podcast a couple weeks ago with Missy Coombs, and, uh, you know, Tina saw it, and she, she said, Dan, I want to get you in touch with uh, with Michelle. I think you guys will will connect, and uh, you know if you want to interview her, she might you know she might be up for that. So, um, first of all, you know thanks, Michelle, and uh, you know again we've just met, but we've exchanged some emails and we've talked for about a half hour before we hit the record button here, and uh, so many things in common, um, but. Specifically here, I want to talk about your your days with the Silver Bullets, and then we'll we'll do another episode where we'll talk about a little bit more of what you're doing now. So, um, again, I coached you got coached against you guys back in 1994 when you played at Reading Municipal Stadium. Um, you're originally from Quaker Down, Quaker Town, Pennsylvania, um, so it was a little bit of a homecoming for you. I know there are some articles uh, specifically written about you after that game, um, but tell me about how your journey with the silver bullet started and what, you know, what made you feel it was, you know, kind of something you, you had to do to play on a women's baseball team as opposed to softball. You're a standout at South Carolina um, on softball. That wasn't actually your original sport. You did start playing baseball. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, first of all, Dan, thank you for doing these podcasts and sharing these wonderful stories of, you know, I've watched the other podcasts of these amazing women athletes and, uh, you know, these are our callings and it's just nice to go back and remember kind of what we went through. Cause for us, it's nostalgic and, um, just thank you for doing this. So yeah, it was, uh, 93. I had just come off, uh, running triple crown, the program touring the country with the team and teaching. And I got an invitation <laughs> from, uh, the silver bullet. So it was an invitation only invite. And my guess is because I was an All-American, and I'm sure they went through the list of All-Americans that would want to choose baseball versus All-Americans that were holding out for the Olympics. So I was in the middle. Of course, I wanted to play, you know, on the 96 Olympic team. All my teammates from the breakouts ended up being on that team. But my first love was baseball, uh, bar none. Uh, my dad was a coach. Uh, my brother played. I played Sandlot baseball back in Quakertown. And uh, I literally kind of had a baseball and a softball in my hand and, and prayed on it. And I knew if you look back at any of my, my articles and interviews, I've always known that my path in sport was a gift from God. And it was a calling that it wasn't about me, that it was his calling on me. So I just looked at the greatest impact and I saw softball as something that I worked very hard at and became very good at. And that path, ironically, coming off, I think in 91, 92, the breakout season was like 81 and one. <laughs> so we were very, very good. Of course, like I said, my entire infield was the 96 mm -hmm. Olympic team. So I don't need to sell you on that. Right. When I looked at the baseball, I saw first love and I saw an incredible challenge and I saw impact. And I just come off watching League of Their Own with my mom and dad making $100 a month as an intern out in Colorado and knew that if I was working for that to impact girls, how cool would this story be? And I literally chose the baseball and went for it. So that's kind of how that went down. And then literally called up as many resources as I could, minor league guys, and just started training <laughs> as hard as I could to learn the game as fast as I could for that level. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So I've got the, uh, like I showed in, in Missy's uh, podcast, I've got the co a copy of the old program here. And uh, you were actually, uh, you had a quote in here in your bio that says, I feel that the silver bullets will give every girl in America a chance to have a female role model and a reason to try anything she wants in life. So again, yeah, you're 25 at the time that you played uh, that year with the Silver Bullets. And that's a pretty powerful quote. And, you know, coming from a relatively young person at that time, um, 
you had some some foresight. Tell me a little bit about that quote. First of all, that just hits me to the core. Um, it gets me emotional. Of course it does, because I, I knew early on, I, I was wise beyond my years, Dan. I knew early on that it was, it, it's a calling, you know, and every quote that you read was me just denouncing the calling on my soul. And there was a purpose in, in every decision that I made. And God had a purpose for that, you know, and it was to be role models and it was to take on what was adversity. I mean, we, we lost a lot, you know, that, that summer and I wasn't accustomed to losing, but it's, it's how you handle losses. And it wasn't just that. I mean, I got to live out my dream, of course. So it fulfilled my childhood dream of playing major league baseball scenes, which was cool. But at the end of the day, it was those, those, those kids, like those, those girls that maybe saw one of us out there doing something that de was deemed impossible a year prior and knowing that we could be a role model for them. And that, like you said, I had foresight. I knew it. I knew the purpose in it. And, and what happened from that is then trying to align my core values with how long I would stay and what I would do with that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, it was different. It was different than some of my teammates and that's okay. But mine was full fledged role model. When I was off the field, I had just signed with Nike. So that was a little bit of a, you know, it was before endorsements. I graduated from the University of South Carolina in sports marketing. So I knew my name and likeness and the, the negotiating of that. And, and Nike, I already built a relationship, you know, with them. And, and I was going against the grain, you know, we we're a Mizuno team. But I kept going back to the girls. How could I make the biggest impact? And Nike was, you know, part of the play program. And I thought, great fit. When we're on the road, I could be doubling up and doing play events at boys and girls clubs. Little girl, little boy, you know, role model. So it, it, for me, it was just honoring the calling. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, it's incredible um, to be able to, again, have that type of foresight at such a young age and, and understand how important it is. Um, you know, when I first got into coaching, um, I was literally coaching my peers. Um, more than anything else. And again, the, the team I coached um, against you guys was a, an adult um, male team. And it wasn't until, you know, I'd coached for probably five or six years until I, you know, actually coaching, started coaching youth. And it was a completely different um, kind of mindset when you really understand the impact that you have on a, on a young person's life. And again, I was, you know, relatively t young at that time as well. Um, you know, so to be able to grasp that, I think, is is pretty, pretty special for sure. So you played one year um, with the Silver Bullets. And, um, you know, again, obviously, every woman on that team had their own story, um, you know, what they'd left to, you know, to do that barnstorming tour for that summer. Um, and then, you know, I guess each year had to kind of weigh because you guys you guys didn't sign multi-million dollar contracts to play for that team. So what, uh, um, what was it that, that led you to just playing there for one year? Great question. And I have a great answer. Uh, you know, I wrote a book a couple of years ago uh, after my mom had passed kind of documenting the answers. You know, a lot of people have heard me speak over the years and uh, I don't, I didn't share a lot about the silver bullets because um, it was a tough decision to make because here's the prize, right? Like this is, as any athlete, the prize is playing professionally, but over here is my look in the mirror. Like, what are you really doing? What are you called to do? And I'm always more, more vested in this, this person looking back and going, are you proud of what you're doing? Is this what you're supposed to do beyond this? Or are you playing for the prize? So for me, early on, Dan, I trained so hard, I overtrained. You know, I went into spring training in incredible shape, uh, starting second baseman, got sick right away. A lot of people don't know that. So I was quarantined, bronchitis, pneumonia, strep throat, uh, quarantined. Gina was my, my roommate, Satriano. And uh, it was devastating because I lost 20 pounds. And I knew that Phil 
would would see that as a you know as baseball that's a week for anybody especially somebody trying to you know carry a, a wood bat that heavy I was like oh man this is gonna look like weakness but I'd never been that sick and I I bounced back but all of a sudden I became a utility player like I was kind of all over the place like Michelle we're gonna put you here 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 and um that kind of already changed my trajectory of the season as a as a player so here's the player the athlete the competitor over here i started really focusing on woman in the mirror cause kids and just trying to really let the team know that that this is their direction it's probably only going to be one year um i was also trying to get my nike deal pushed through um and then lo and behold in california uh, I ended up, Phil put me in, in right field and I threw a ball from the warning track home on a one hop and tore my rotator cuff. So I felt like God knew that maybe the next couple years, as enjoyable as that would have been as a professional athlete and as impactful as it was for my, my other teammates, which was awesome. For me, it was way more like grassroots like Michelle I need you to just do this for one year and it made my it made my decision easy at the end of the year because I had to have yeah I went down to Dr. Chandler with the Atlanta Braves that was what was cool is we did have good you know good like connections and I had my rotator cuff surgery you know a year a year after the season and almost a year and then went and rehabbed in California and just really couldn't make it back. I don't want to say couldn't because that's an excuse. Right. Um, didn't really want to. Was really then committed, fully committed to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do what I'm called to do off the field and start really focusing on building opportunities for for girls and women through sport. How difficult of a decision was that? Because, like you said, work ethic that you had, you came back from a tough sickness the first year and battled and got on the field. Um, so obviously you, you could have made that journey to get healthy and get back on the team. So, you know, it, to, to kind of accept that calling, how, how difficult it, was it? It was humbling. <laughs> it's, you're in a world as a, as a, as an athlete, first of all, there, there's this assumption that there's ego, you know, and I look at his ego as edging God out, especially as I've matured in my faith and you have to be competitive or you're going to get crushed. Right. So my ego was on the line of like, okay, I've, I've given up pretty much the Olympics for this, you know? So the decision was a work in progress. It was like the calling card days when you like, you know, you spent like 50 bucks calling card, you know, you're like, mom, what do you think? I'm lighting a candle, Michelle, on your decision. You know, dad's like, stick it out. We don't quit. We're the Losos. I'm like, I'm not quitting. But dad, like, you know, like it was like, I, I always know the answers. Like good friends that know me know that I will always go within. I will always go within. But I like to go to family and others and, you know, make sure that they're part of it. You know, that I am praying and pausing. And so for me, honestly, Dan, it was always checking throughout the season, like, this is starting to feel like a salmon swimming upstream. You know, like I got back, I was starting to put my weight, getting my strength back, but then when the rotator cuff, but then in the midst of it, I had an unbelievable game in Oakland. Like that, you know, to this day I talk about it because it's like I already, I already reached what I was trying to seek ego wise. Like I, I got it. Right. And some people like they keep trying to, it's an insatiable need as an athlete. I got it. I got my validation and we could talk about it. And then I took it and said, that was all I needed. The next week I was in right field. That was a coach's decision toward the rotator cuff. And I'm like, I got the sign. Let's go on. Let's move on. Yeah. So I took the best of it. And then I also felt truly in my heart, don't take away a spot for someone else that needs this in her life. And, and it's that profound calling of like, there's someone training right now, Michelle, that wants this. And if you're going to go on and do this, then you better open that door up and not hang on. And that's one of the things I struggle with, with people in coaching or careers is when you stay too long and you, you know, you're, you're holding on to this and you should be over here. Yeah, so no doubt. no doubt. So when you first heard about the silver bullets, um, was there a point in time where you kind of thought like, is this real? Like, 
you know, is this just a, the novelty tags? I know a lot of the, the media around our game um, talked about the silver bullets aren't a novelty. They've shaken the novelty tag. I mean, for, for you guys going to camp, going to the tryout camp, was there a part of you that was thinking, you know, this isn't for real? No, I knew what I was getting myself into um, because, like I said, my degree was in sports marketing and I already begun the process of the industry of sport and the, and, and the business, you know, learning like people most, most times make decisions based on return on investment. But I thought it was also cool. I, I did know, like, I felt like strongly the movie League of Their Own, that the marketing arm beyond, you know, behind the, the silver bullets, there was, there was a marketing arm behind them they kind of saw that exhibition and made the curveball instead of competing against women we'll put them on display against men we'll try and get them in major league stadiums so it was it was awesome so that knowledgeable michelle was like this is i see the you know that's why i was looking reading every contract and helping my teammates like we got to be careful with name and likeness and they're you know a lot of them were just really like stoked right and i'm like but we're giving up right so but then the kid, the dreamer, you know, was like, let's just do it, you know? So I was kind of like, it is real, but it's really cool too. You know what I mean? So I was in the middle for sure. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what was it like playing for, for Phil and Joe? Listen, I, I'm a hard on the sleeve girl. I'll tell it as I see it. Um, I, I love Joe. Like Joe and I got along really well. Phil was tough on me. And I don't... <laughs> Like I, uh, you know, I, I thought the concept was cool again, cause I watched League of Their Own. So my expectations were, I grew up playing with boys, you know, and then I, I literally went to the minor league players in Columbia, you know, I trained with them. So I was kind of prepared for, you know, Michelle, like softball, you guys are really emotional. You're really passionate. Like baseball is kind of like, you know, and Phil was, Phil was that guy, you know, like, let's just get it done. Like, da da, you know? And uh, it, it, it was cool in the concept of what it was, you know what I mean? But then again, I, I was facing ad adversity. So for, for this, this person over here with the ego of like, I want to play Phil, like I'm back, right? Well, utility, like, you know what I mean? So I was, it's how it is with a coach player that's like, get me back in the lineup. So for me, it, it, it was cool for what it was, you know, that yeah. I, was, I was playing for two major leaguers and the way they set that up was an opportunity mm -hmm. itself to kind of learn and, 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 and grow from that, that cool experience. Yeah, that's cool. So um, like I said, I've, I've talked to a couple other players um, and, you know, bring up that game in Reading and, you know, obviously for most of it was kind of just another game. So I think it's kind of cool that we've been able to connect because it was more than just another game for you. I mean, Reading and Quaker town are, 45, 50 minutes apart. Um, so what was that, you know, I guess when the schedule came out and you saw you're going to be playing a game, you know, not far from your hometown, what was the feeling like that? And then going into the game, I'm sure you had a lot of family and friends out there to, to root you on. I was blessed to. Absolutely. I, um, it's hard not to get emotional because it took a lot to get to that game and start at second. That's my position. So I'd come off I definitely want to talk about the Oakland game because that was such a symbolic game in my, in my career with the silver bullets, which was a year, but to know that I was going to start at second and, and knowing my family and all my friends were there in Pennsylvania, it, you, I just had hoped on that. I prayed on that, that I would be healthy enough to show up for all of those people because they know me as, you know, the, the female athlete that delivers that's going to shine and uh i knew like second with my rotator cuff torn you know i played that game with it torn um that that was the best the way i could still excel on the field is playing second versus like if i were to start in the outfield or something like that right. so i was beyond beyond happy first of all i know i was eating well because I'm Italian so like all these people that have these training regimens Dan like I know I probably had pizza and a tasty cake and a Wawa pretzel before the game you know what I mean so like give me that I can I can like pretty much do anything I can jump through the field you know <laughs> wall no, yeah no doubt. 
Yeah, I was pretty stoked to see. To yeah, once I saw I was in the lineup, fired up. Yeah, fired up. So I uh, I have a whole bunch of news clippings, and uh, here's here's the clipping from the morning call um, after our game. I'm trying to, and uh, <laughs> you know, obviously a, a pitcher of you, and uh, you know obviously solar bullets lost uh, for nothing despite Delosa's play. Um, you know, I, I literally, people probably think I'm crazy when I tell this story, but, you know, 1994, we didn't have the technology we had today. So, like, the day after that game, like, I literally drove all over, like, four different counties to pick up copies <laughs> of all the newspapers in the area. And I still got a scrapbook of them, and I'm, you know, glad I did. But um, Thank you. was there any, you know, particular moment during that game that, you know, kind of sticks out in your head or, you know, was it just having that much family and friends around or, you know, what, what made that homecoming so special? I think knowing the adversity that I had, had gone through, maybe that no one saw that season and, and my philosophy of life is keep on keeping on to know that I battled back and was on that field. And then, like you said, after that game, I don't know if you remember all the kids lined up for the autographs Oh yeah. and knowing that I delivered even when it was tough to deliver that I, I was completely engulfed and present in that moment. And I know my family was proud and my friends of that and that they showed up that I had, you know, I had everyone there seeing someone live out a dream, you know, and they'll never know. No one ever knows what was inside you. They, they always think that when you attain certain things in life, like it must be like this, you know, or they have it all, or they, they don't know the battles, but when I'm sitting there signing the ball for the kids and they want that autograph and you become that role model, maybe because of that uniform that you wore that double play when I was taking, I still made the play. That's, isn't that what the quote was before I even started the season? So yes. I think having family there to witness that, that's, that's my dream. Right. And that's, I'm seeing it. So that was really cool. So there's a couple things that stick out to me from that game. Um, I mean, number one, we played in front of over 5,600 people, which you, know, for you guys was kind of the typical crowd. But for, you know, all of us, it was, you know, probably the largest crowd that, that any of us played in front of. Um, but I remember the bulk of the fans were rooting for you guys, not us. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> usually how it was, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the other thing, you know, you mentioned about the autograph line. Um, what I actually thought was pretty cool about the autograph line is in addition to those young kids that you guys were signing for, um, there were a lot of my players and us who were standing in those autograph lines as well, who just played against you guys. So, you know, obviously there's a, a really cool feeling when you're signing that autograph for a kid, but when a guy who you just played a game against, you know, and was just taking you out at second base on a double play <laughs> is walking up to you, you know, grown man looking for your autograph. I mean, how did that make you guys feel? Cause I think that really kind of encompassed how powerful that team was far beyond the game of baseball. Well, that's the adult version living out the goal. You know, that's us as female athletes and women saying, you know what, that's the respect that we, we have quested for on and off the field. You know, the fact that, you're asking us for an autograph. You recognize that we're somewhat a part of history, you know, that you're respecting that we're taking on something that's not easy and you're acknowledging it. And that's kind of that respect. That was cool. You know, like, all right, because we lost, right? Like that's what people fail to remember. Like we lost way more games than we won, Dan. So the competitive Michelle's like, wait a second, but guys, we just lost. Like I'm always like reminding everybody that we just lost because I'm competitive. Right. But then the history part is that like hitting yourself, like sometimes until you're older, you don't realize what you're doing and you probably were in the moment of it. You know, you were on the outside looking in, like I said, you were seeing it for what it was and we were just literally in the moment like oh this is cool these guys like want our you know our autographs same thing like in the big league stadiums like these guys want our autographs dude this is awesome but i think other people were seeing it for the history that it that it was going to become so yeah. that that was really cool so obviously writing game was very special to you um you talked about the oakland game um any more you want to say about the oakland game yeah i want to say everything about the oakland game because imagine <laughs> 
imagine a young kid that has Ozzie Smith and all these male baseball players that never saw a female athlete in a baseball uniform in a baseball stadium, but knew that in her heart of hearts, one day she would get to do that. Like, where did that come from? Right. Higher power from the Lord. Like, and you, you are, you're not a third baseman, but you're getting the starting nod in the Oakland Coliseum at third. And you're like, I got this before it's before the rotator cuff. I've healed from the illness. I'm feeling like I, I have goosebumps. Like I'm solid. I'm like, just, I'm a machine at third. <laughs> and like, I'm like, and we're literally playing a very competitive game, you know, against, the, I think it was the junior co- It was a, it was a competitive men's team, but the A's were watching. Like the A's did such, they probably did the best job of hosting us from the pregame to knowing we were going to be up in the, VIP seats watching to televising to the jumbotron. They were engulfed in making sure that this moment was like documented number one, but perfect for us. And I just played so beyond like anything I ever dreamed of. It was the best game of my life, bar none. And so much so, I love to share this story that after the game, Scott Brocious, who plays third base for the A's, uh, gave me his glove. I made two plays that to me are, are honestly kind of routine, but they were two dives. One where I, you know, like, well, one was a dive. One was where I kind of picked it up through it the first one was the dive. And then one they didn't capture as a dive, but they put him on the jumbotron. And then Scott, after the game said, you should be playing third for us today. And he <laughs> gave me his glove. And I was like, Dan, come on. I was like, it's, it's done. It's, it's been accomplished. Like, we are good. And it was just, it was just so cool. And then like we met the players and um, the coaches and they just, you know, they loved us. I, it was the highlight of my season as a player. And then of course we had, it was packed. We did the autographs after, but then we got to go up in a VIP seat seating area. And then they replayed the plays on the jumbotron. And you're like, that's, that's the pinnacle. Like that, was all of the ground balls as a kid, like your one moment. And, and sometimes that's all you get in life is that one moment. So I will forever talk about that Oakland game because then soon after a week later I was in, you know, I was utility, right? So I could have the game of my life that, you know, somebody thinks I should be third for the A's. Then I'm in right field. So then I'm like, okay, once the rotator cuff went, I'm like, it, it just made the decision, right? It just, it, that's what it's about. It's what life is about. It's like, take it as far as you could take it. Go fulfill that destiny. For others, it's different. But that was mine. That was my moment. And then, then again, in writing, kind of honoring, you know, and then go, go take that momentum and energy and go just deliver an unbelievable calling for others. And that's kind of wh- where I took the best of it and ran with it. That's 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 awesome, and that's that's a great story. Um, we're just about out of time on this episode, um, but any last things you want to add about your career as a silver bullet specifically? I'm, you know, I'm inc- incredibly appreciative for the opportunity with the silver bullets. Um, one of the things I will say is, you know, Coors, it, it, it's it's not a secret. You know, Coors Brewing Company was the sponsor, which was awesome for what they did to step up. Obviously, I've been in sports marketing, the industry now for, was in it 25 years. I don't drink. <laughs> so that, you know, without like closing, I'm going to close with a reality and then I'm gonna close with a positive and silver bullet experience. Beyond getting hurt and knowing like, it, it also wasn't the best fit for me, right? Because when we weren't doing the playing and the training and I wasn't doing the Nike events, we were contracted to do promotional events and what was cool about fighting for our rights is like we made a deal with our team which was cool with our team is like some people would do the bar promotions and then those of us that didn't drink would do the grocery store promotions so it was really cool to like see that kind of come to fruition of like what you're getting yourself into and going okay like I probably should step away because I'm I'm not going to be able to authentically deliver the return but the fact that they didn't ask it of us, like you didn't have to drink to be on the team. It was a true sponsorship of like, yeah, we hope probably that we get our return, but we're going to step up and do this. So that's, you know, commending the people that 
put money behind women's sports. I will always thank them for what they did. And then the positive is I would love Dan, as I'm sure you with your life and your dedication to kids in sports, which thank you so much. I'm sure you wonder someday what those kids are doing, you know, and I think that's, that's what I, I know we've done, but I hope and pray that any of those girls that watched us play that heard us speak at our off the field events that, that they know that they're never alone, that we believe in them as, 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 as much as they believed in us back then and that they live their dreams just as much as we get to live ours and that we continue, especially through this pandemic, to build those opportunities for girls and women and that people step up and they're not afraid to try. I mean, our record was not good. My statistics for the first time in my life were not good. And sometimes that's all that people look at. Right. But if we could get the world to stop looking at numbers and putting us in boxes, and we look at the purpose and the impact of what we're doing in our lives, we're all going to be better for it. And that's kind of what that experience was for me, even though it was short lived is taking the most of what you have, realizing things over here are different, but coming together for a greater good. And I think we did the best, you know, the best we could with that. And we seized it despite our record. No, absolutely. And I think that's a great, Great way to end on it. And uh, again, the, the impact is, you know, greater um, than what the record is for sure. So, um, all right. So we're going to have you back on another podcast and talk a lot more about what Michelle's doing today. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be back here shortly about that. But uh, uh, real quick, uh, for people to catch up on you today, if you can give a little shout out to the website and the organization, and then we'll do a whole podcast dedicated to that. So um, let people know how they can find out about Michelle today. Wonderful. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, I am running the Go Girl Futures program as one of my passion projects and the Rim to Rim Club of the Grand Canyon. So you could either go to michelledeloso.com, which sends you over to gogirlprogram.com, which is, that's one of, one of my passion projects right there. And then as well, I have the Rim to Rim Club of the Grand Canyon, rimtorim.org. So that is what I, I am focused on right now. I had some, as we discussed, some health battles last year. So I've been solely focused on my passion projects right now. So that's how they can find me. Cool. We'll talk about that here uh, in a little bit. And folks, as always, for myself, check out more of my blogs and podcasts at danclauser.com. Michelle, thanks for joining me. and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll be back.